Hello, welcome back. Uh, let's first do some review of the previous lecture. Okay, so we basically solve the, uh, we formulate the problem of support vector machine model, SVM model as a um, optimization problem with constraints. Okay, and that constraints, uh, let's go to the previous slides. Okay, so the constraints um, a, contain a bunch of um, inequalities. Okay, and those inequalities are like for each data points, we have one uh, inequality constraints. Okay, so in order to solve this optimization problem, well, this is uh, in the case of uh, this slide. So this is the uh, target variable or target function that we want to minimize. And here are the bunch of constraints, okay? So we use a Lagrangian multiplier or we convert it into a <clears throat> uh, duality problem that we need to uh, minimize, we need to uh, minimize the Lagrangian with respect to WMB and maximize it with respect to alpha, okay? And alpha is the new um, Lagrangian multiplier that we created for each uh, inequality constraints, okay? So we can eliminate the WMBs in the Lagrangian and with only the expressions with alpha that's left, okay? So it becomes a uh, optimization problem with only with respect to alpha, okay? So we basically want to uh, minimize uh, the alpha or maximize the alpha, maximize the Lagrangian with respect to alpha with some constraints, okay? The constraints are now this in these equation forms, okay? Okay, so we basically can um, solve this maximization or minimization problem with respect to a quadratic function using some uh, predefined quadratic programming softwares. Okay, so the software will return a uh, the alpha solutions to this uh, optimization problem. So basically, all we need to do is to tell the program or to tell the software that the coefficients are like this in this matrix Q. Okay, so this is a matrix. This matrix is uh, something we can construct based by our observation on the training data points. Okay, it's purely from the training data points. It's a. Uh, it's if you're. Uh, you have a lot of examples, then your matrix would be big, okay? So this is Q is something we want to, we need to uh, tell the uh, quadratic programming software that's what the input is, okay? So um, in, in a, one of the quiz uh, question, we use a very tiny uh, toy data set to compute, um, to compute uh, the, uh, the one row of this Q matrix. So I think it's a uh, it's an interesting uh, experiment uh, that you can do on paper because I have four data point, uh, five data points provided. And if you plot that five data points on the paper, then you can see that it's basically uh, two clusters. And if you want to tell them apart, you basically need to draw a linear line. And the mate, if you, in, in, in assignments, so in assignment that I'm going to uh, release tomorrow, we will have a complete example using this uh, toy data sets, okay? Um, but we will not need to write a quadratic programming software from scratch. And that's a very uh, complex task, which we don't need to do as long as we uh, install the uh, third-party packages in Python, we can just call it as a external tool. And we provide it with the queues. And we provide it with the constraints, okay. So that's how we solve alpha. 
and then after this we talk about we talk about the so okay so one more thing i want to mention here uh as a reveal so for alphas the majority of the alphas will be zero because uh these are non-support vectors okay only a small part of the uh, within the data sets help to decide to to determine the shape of the decision boundary so these are the actual uh these data points with positive alpha values are the support vectors and then we can use the positive alphas to um to solve the w and b's accordingly okay so that's the simple svm model that doesn't consider the uh, problem of nonlinearity or the problem of uh, cases where data points cannot be separated by a linear line or linear decision boundary, linear hyperplane. So for those not linearly separable data points, we use the example shown here to, to transform all the data points to some unknown space, to some Z space, and uh, we hope that in the Z space, it will be easier to draw some linear, uh, uh, to, to obtain some linear separator or linear decision boundaries, and then transform the boundary back so that we have the uh, solution in the original space, okay? So we have shown that some explicitly defined uh, transformation can lead to some uh, exp explainable or interpretable so interpretable decision boundaries, okay? But it is not necessarily uh, the case because we don't need to know the exact form of the transformation. So in, the, in this example, we know that the transformation is a quadratic function, right? But as long as we uh, know the existence of such a transformation and we can compute the inner product or dot product between all the data points z's, then it is sufficient. We don't know. We don't need to know the exact form of the transformation, because in order to solve the quadratic uh, programming problem, in order to solve the optim optimization problem, we only need to know uh, what the inner products between the data points. Right. We just need to. Uh, compute the inner product and construct the Q matrix and provide it to the software and uh, we are done with it. So basically we don't need to know what exact each data, what each Z point is, what each point in Z space is and what each, uh, actually we need to know, uh, we just need to know the inner product between the two data points, okay? So, um, and, and inner product can, go beyond the traditional definition of inner product or, um, um, or dot products because we don't know the dimensions of the Z space. It could be very high, the, the number of dimensions. It could be a lot of dimensions. So it could be even be infinite number of dimensions. So we don't care about that information also. We just need to define the kernel method. Um, which is here, we just define a kernel method and this kernel function or kernel uh, method is something that we uh, compute the inner product in this space uh, directly. So this kernel function could be a quadratic function or higher order polynomial function, or it could be some uh, exponential function uh, like the RBF kernel did. Okay, so in the RBF example, the kernel function can be an exponential function um, with, uh, uh, with the original inner product <coughs> or the, the, distance, the distance within the original X space as the inputs and it returns the expon exponential function of it. So this RBF kernel, it actually corresponds to, it represents the meaning behind this RBF is we are computing a inner product uh, uh, within a <clears throat> um, within a Z space that has uh, infinite number of dimensions. Okay, but that is just a piece of information that we can know. But it doesn't uh, it doesn't um, 
uh, increase the difficulty of, of doing the computation because in practice, we are not, we are not using the Tyler expansion to do uh, these many actual you know, products in practice. We just compute this exponential function. So these steps are in the purpose of these steps is to show that in theory, we can explain the exponential function, the RBF kernel as some inner product in a uh, infinite dimension space. Okay. So uh, there are a lot of common uh, kernel functions we can choose to use. Uh, and this kernel function is also some uh, hyperparameter uh, that means the, the the options we need to uh, we need to carefully tune. We need to uh, we need to do experiments uh, in order to know which one is 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 a good is a good one. Okay. So before we have any before we have done any experiment actual experiments on the data, we don't know what kind of kernel uh, works the best because we don't know the properties of the data points. We don't know how much nonlinearity there is in the data. Right. If the data is perfectly separable in its original space, then we just simply use a linear kernel. We just use a linear uh, SVM. If there's some, um, uh, if the data is not linear, linearly separable, then we need to try different, uh, basically different kernels. All right. And the kernels also comes with the hyperparameters of its own, like the polynomial kernel, we have alphas, betas stuff. So uh, <clears throat> it's all of the, 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 the final decision is based on the experiments, the empirical results. All right. So uh, using a kernel doesn't change the step for quadratic program because using a kernel only change the coefficients in the Q matrix, right? We are not using the original inner product in X but we use some function applied to uh, the X, okay? That's the only difference. And we obtain the results uh, by solving the quadratic programming and the results will return the alpha, right? And we can use the alpha uh, to identify the support vectors in Z space, okay? Not in X space, but we in Z space, we can still use them to solve the W and also, use the equation of the decision boundary in Z space to solve, w, to solve B, okay? So with W and B solved, then we have the decision boundary, okay? And actually we don't need to actually transform the uh, decision boundary back to the X because we can directly use the Z space to do the classification because it's easy to, uh, because it's easy to compute this kernel function given any pairs of data points, right? Because we, we, we just want to, uh, um, given the new data points, we just want to know on which side that data point is on, on which side it is over the decision boundary. If it's on the left side of decision boundary, okay, it belongs to one class. If it's on the other side, it belongs to the other. So we just need to tell the signs uh, of this equation, which basically tells which side that new data point is at. And, but it's, it's based on the Z space uh, representation. So we need to use the uh, kernels instead of the, the dot products. Okay, so that's it. And, Now we basically need to talk about another. So the, the rest of the SVM is about <clears throat> the case um, that we need to uh, solve. Uh, we need to consider if the margin, um, we can, if we cannot find a perfect margin, okay? We, if there's some data points that are misclassified uh, under a hard hard margin. So how do we tolerate these cases? And so that our SVM models are more general and robust, okay? So 
the soft margin case is more, um, it's not as extreme as the uh, non-linearly separable data that kernel method is deal with. So for, for data points that are extremely or seriously non-linearly separable, the kernel method is probably the, the thing you wanna, the method you wanna use. But at the same time, if the uh, data are not, uh, are basically uh, linearly separable, but there are only some um, noises along the decision boundaries. There's um, some misclassifications every uh, here and there, then we basically want to ignore those cases, right? But so we will use some technical uh, tricks to, to change, to alter the learning goals or to, to, to alter the target functions of the optimization so that we can learn a decision boundary that are more tolerant. Okay, so, so now we are basically, we basically look at in this case on the left in which there is some um, like slight misclassifications within the data, these uh, outliers or these noisy data points. So we want the, um, the decision boundary to allow the existence of such uh, slight uh, bias or slight uh, outliers, okay? So now we need to look at the margins uh, again, okay? So because in the, in the previous contents, we defined a perfect margin. By perfect margin, I mean there's nothing in this area, okay? Nothing within the, uh, the margin, so within the margin area, because we made it, we, we, we defined that that's the, the the margin is defined by the the nearest uh, the distance between the nearest data points and the decision boundary. Okay, so the data points in the dashed circle they are the nearest data points. <clears throat> so we know that uh, for the support for the support vectors, so these are the the data points in the dashed circles. They are the so-called support vectors, and they satisfy the equation that y times the w times x plus b equals one, okay? So that's uh, how they are defined. And for the, any data points outside the margin that are apart away, that are farther away from the margin, like these data points, they satisfy that this, this expression should be greater than one, should be strictly greater than one, okay? So if we allow, some violations here. So there are two types of violations actually. First, if the expression is uh, less than one but still greater than zero, then we say it violates the margin like this uh, blue um, data points within the margin does, okay? It's greater than zero because it's still on the same side Right, it, it's still closer to the to its uh, blue neighbors. It's not closer to the uh, yellow neighbors, right? And that's the first case of violation. And the other case of violation, if the expression y times w times x plus b is a negative number, is smaller than zero, then it's basically a misclassification, just like this. Uh, yellow, uh, just like this yellow data points because it's it's on the wrong side. We want, we want it to be actually over here, right? But it's, it's misclassified as a blue according to our uh, uh, decision boundary, okay? So we basically need to deal with this, uh, uh, errors and we allow the, we need to change the optimization goal so that we can allow for some errors to happen, okay? And we, what we do, what we need to do is to use a uh, slack to measure the violation, okay?
Okay, we need to use a quantity. Okay, so we will change uh, the uh, right side of this inequality. So because previously it is one, right? We we want it. We want the uh, uh, we basically. Uh, in the pre previously, we, we believe that all data points, they satisfy this inequality. They should be either B1, if, if the data points are on the margin, if they are, uh, if they are beyond the margin, then it, they're farther away from the margin and it is greater than one. But now we, we, we allow for cases that this quantity can be smaller than one. It could be even uh, negative, okay? So we use a uh, epsilon, uh, to indicate this little slack quantity that we allow, okay? So this uh, epsilon quantity is a positive number, okay? And we use this slack uh, quantity or variable to penalize the total violation into the, to, to add a penalization term into the optimization goal. Okay, so because this quantity measures how much mistake we are making. If that slack is zero, then we are basically, we are not making any mistake at all, right? And uh, if it is a positive number that is strictly than zero, then we actually, there are some errors happening. So this is the amount of, the summation of all the epsilons is the total amount of violation that we, uh, observed from all the data points. And actually we want this mistake to be uh, uh, as small as possible, okay? Even though it can happen, but still we want, it, we, we want to uh, penalize the, the errors, okay? So um, yeah, now let's look at the next step. We want to change the goal of the optimization. So previously, it is just to minimizing this quantity, minimizing the dot products between uh, the inner product of W, okay? So we now want to minimize the original term plus this new term, which measures the total error, okay? Because we want the error to be small, as small as possible. And um, we put it into the optimization goal because the optimization is a minimization problem. Okay, so it's a suitable choice we want to minimize the errors. And also we put a C here. So C is a constant that controls the strength of this, um, it controls how um, strong we want to penalize the errors. It's just like, I hope this in, in, uh, remind you of the, the L2 regular regularization, when we uh, talk, when we introduce it to as a technique to uh, to avoid overfitting in logistic regressions, right? We in the L2 regularization, we also uh, use a constant lambda to control the strength of the uh, L2, uh, the the regularization, the regularization, right? Str larger lambdas means we want to penalize the Ws more. And in this case, it's a similar thought. We just use this constant to control the strength, uh, the, the, the degree of uh, penalization on the epsilon, okay? And our constraints also changed, right? Because we use a uh, epsilon here. So that means we need to, change, uh, we, need to, we need to solve this uh, problem with a new Lagrangian, uh, with a new Lagrangian multiplier or, or a Lagrangian uh, duality problem, okay? And, um, okay, so from, from the other, from another new perspective, if we want to interpret the quant constant quantity C, it actually quantifies the relative importance of the uh, to to avoid the violations. Okay, so larger c means that 
we really want to avoid <coughs> the small mistakes. Okay, when C is little or has a very small value, then it means we don't actually care too much, too much about uh, the little mistakes, and we allow more. Uh, we we give more tolerance to those cases. Okay, let's carry on. And so that that means if C if we set the C to be big values, the all the parameters will be learned in a way that only small mistakes will be allowed. And uh, if C, uh, if C is small, then the Ws will be learned in a way that only the, the big epsilons are allowed. So give me a second, I'll be right back. Okay, uh, what are the values exactly in the Slack array? Okay, so the Slacks, uh, the, it's a variable that we need to, uh, we need to learn from the optimization process. So it'll be automatically picked up just like the uh, Ws and uh, Bs during the, uh, the learning process, the training process. Okay, so we basically uh, now the next step is to construct a new Lagrangian uh, form. Okay, so we now have uh, epsilon as a new parameter or a new um, uh, learning the, a, ver a target variable. No, this new optimization occurs at the same time with, uh, with the alpha, with the alpha and the epsilon. So we are training or learning alpha, uh, epsilon, and W and B at the same time. Okay, it's a it's a it's a joint learning process. It's not like we train. We train a linear SVN first. We get an alpha, and then on top of that, we train the epsilon again. No, it's not like that. It's a joint training process. Okay, so we introduce the epsilon here, and because it's a new, <coughs> because the new target includes the uh, penalty to the slack. Okay, and we also uh, uh, the the we also have a plus uh, plus epsilon here because it, the constraints also changed the constraints uh, there there's a the constraint on the right side of the constraints is one minus epsilon so that minus epsilon will also be incorporated into the Lagrangian form okay so and. Uh, because it's a new Lagrangian, each time we we uh, introduce a, a new condition, we need to uh, import a Lagrangian, import a, include a new Lagrangian multiplier for W. Okay, because epsilon is greater than zero, we need to have another uh, Lagrangian uh, multiplier beta. So the row of beta is just like the row of alpha. Okay. So uh, it looks uh, this uh, very long expression, but after we take the derivatives with respect to uh, W and B, then basically it'll be almost the same thing as the previous uh, uh, simplified Lagrangian, okay? So we minimize the Lagrangian with respect to W, B and uh, um, epsilon and the maximize with respect to alpha and the betas, okay? 
So that's still a uh, duality problem, but with with more with two more parameters. Okay. So still we do the experiments, we do the, we, we need to take the derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to W. So this derivative is the same form as the original one and same for the Bs, okay? And for epsilon, okay? So for epsilon, it's quite, uh, uh, for quite, it's, it's quite uh, uh, simple because the, the coefficients before the epsilon i is just uh, alpha i and the beta i, right? It's uh, right here, right? Alpha i and the beta i and the constant c here, okay? So if we take derivatives uh, with respect to theta i, we have such a, a bunch of conditions here, okay? And then if we replace it, into uh, into the summation form into the original Lagrangian, we go we'll we will find that all the all these three terms they are eliminated, right? Because of this uh, because of this equation, right? If we take the derivative with respect to epsilon and make it zero, then as a result, these terms with epsilon and beta are gone, okay? So everything left, it's exactly the same Lagrangian, okay? But only with additional constraints, okay? The additional constraints is that the alpha needs to be smaller than C, okay? And the because it's, it's, it's according to this uh, condition, right? Because the C minus alpha minus beta should be zero. And we already know that beta is a positive number, okay? So alpha becomes C minus beta, right? So because beta is positive, so the C must be bounded by the hyperparameter C. Okay, so previously we have C, the alphas that are uh, that are unbounded, right? But this time the the alpha is bounded by the C. That's the that's the only difference we got. Okay, so solving this uh, Lagrangian uh, with modified uh, constraints we will have alphas. And then we can, uh, up, after we obtain the results for the, from the quadratic programming, we can solve Ws, right? Which minimize this function. And we can ob obtain the Ws and the Bs accordingly, okay? So now with this slack term exists in the, in the, in the optimization goal, we can have, we, we will have, we will obtain a um, decision boundary that are, that behave slightly differently because we allow for the, uh, the existence of uh, mistakes, okay? So for the margin uh, support vectors, so they are, they correspond to the alphas that are greater than zero, but bounded by C, okay? So, and this should be strictly greater than because um, in this case, the, the um, beta is greater than zero and uh, the slack is zero, okay? And for the non-margin support vector, so this time we have a new types of support vectors. These are the non-margins and they correspond to the, the condition where the alpha equals C, okay? In which uh, the expression is, the expression Y times W times X plus B is smaller than one, okay? But they are within the margin, okay? So the slack is greater than zero and the corresponding alpha beta is zero, okay? So, this also we have two cases, okay? 
for the non-margins, if they are on the correct side, it simply, it, it just violates margin, but it is correctly classified, okay? So these correspond to the, uh, these two data type, these two data points that are on the correct side of the discern boundary, okay? But they, the, the slack is bigger than zero. So they are um, within the margin. So they're kind of the non-margin support vectors. But for the other ones that has the quantity, this expression y times w transpose times x plus b is less than zero, then it crosses the discern boundary and going to the other side, okay? And these are the miss of uh, classifications. So um, that's the uh, more, if we introduce the slack, the decision boundary will give more, basically more complex outputs or will classify the different data points into basically more complex classes. Okay. So um, that's how we interpret the decision boundaries if we introduce the, uh, if we allow for the misclassifications. Okay. So now we have uh, introduced the C's, right? And uh, the C will just actually decide uh, how much uh, how much mistake we allow, okay? So the, it is a parameter that we need to uh, uh, we need to pro, we need to choose, okay? And uh, in practice, usually we will not start with a hard uh, hard margin like the linear SVM we first introduced because a hard margin will result in a decision boundary that try not to make mistake at all, which will, uh, which is first difficult to achieve, right? And um, it is likely that the training would not be, would not converge. And also it is not ideal if we draw a um, decision boundary that's perfectly classify everything that is likely to become a overfitting case, okay? So the soft margin is usually the default option, okay? And the typical values for the Cs, which decide the strengths of uh, penalty to the mistakes, we can choose from uh, such a discrete uh, set of uh, values, ranges from a very small value uh, to a uh, pretty big values, okay? These are the uh, results from experimental, from uh, basically from empirical uh, experiments. Okay. So we can do a lot of experiments and use cross validation to determine what kind of the C that is the best choice, okay? And often we combine it with kernel methods like the procedure is to first apply some kernel, say RBF kernel, so that we map all the data points to a Z space, right? And then we choose uh, the proper um, um, proper Cs within that new uh, within that new Z space to do a to try to find a linear to find a to try to find a linear distance boundary in Z space, okay? So often we combine these two um, techniques. So uh, SVM is a very mature technique and uh, it's not a, not a deep model, but uh, it's usually the one of the first choice that we want to choose as a um, baseline model, okay, because the, the idea behind is uh, very smart and concise and is clearly defined. And we can do kernel tricks and uh, the soft margin technique to usually we can uh, obtain a pretty good results uh, for most classification tasks. Okay. 
<clears throat> so that's um, basically uh, everything about um, SVM. I think the core lies in the, <clears throat> the way we construct our optimization goal. <clears throat> right, we <clears throat> construct the Lagrangian multiplier alpha, <clears throat> a Lagrangian. Um, the alpha is the variable that we are um, optimizing, uh, minimum uh, optimize, optimizing the Lagrangian with respect to, and this alpha um, basically determines so what kind of which part of the data points they uh, are the support vectors, okay? And uh, kernel tricks can be applied pretty uh, in a pretty straightforward way to um, to the original data points, and uh, it only results in a new uh, Q matrix, okay? And the soft margins um, can also be um, applied with only a sl slight change to the constraints of the optimization problem, but not, not changing the form of the optimization call at all, because the new constraints, the new variables, uh, the new Lagrangian multiplier beta, they will be gone um, from, the, from the Lagrangian after really take the derivatives. So that's uh, everything we have, I guess, here. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so um, we have time and I think I'm gonna um, stop the video, uh, stop the recording.